It's July 30, 1975. The former president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Jimmy Hoffa, is called to a meeting at the Matches Red Fox Restaurant in Bloomfield Township, the northwestern suburb of Detroit. Hoffa had been the president of the Teamsters, one of the United States' largest labor unions, for almost a decade and a half prior to the meeting. He used to be, arguably, one of the most powerful men in the country. But in 1971, he was swindled out of his position after getting out of jail, ending his long career in the Union. Hoffa was angry at what had happened to him and was trying to squeeze his way back into the top position, much to the disapproval of his Mafia connections. Mafiosi from Detroit, Scranton, and Newark were all against him rising to the top spot with three major players in the United States underworld. Tony Giacalone, Russell Buffalino, and Tony Provenzano, all siding against him. Hoffa began anxiously pacing around the parking lot. Four maroon Mercury sedan pulled up with three men inside of it. Hoffa greeted the men, got inside of the car, and was never seen again. Quando la luna manata tutta si viglia, di caro canata, ora sotto le stelle la tua canzone alle bimbe belle. It's the early 1900s. Detroit is a blossoming, industrial city. Located along the Detroit River, the city is home to the rapidly growing U.S. industry of car manufacturing. Like any metropolitan area, Detroit was infested with a criminal underworld that brought in thousands upon thousands of dollars in illicit funds. For over a decade and a half, the city's criminal landscape was under the control of Pietro Mirabile, a native Telcamo. He was reported as one of the city's largest criminal figures in the late 1800s, and he ran his profitable black hand racket out of a saloon he owned on Rivered Street. The Black Hand was an early criminal racket that arose out of the immigrant communities in the United States' metropolitan areas. It was a disorganized criminal network of Italian extortionists who threatened the victims of their extortion through ransom letters. The practice originated back in Sicily in the 1700s, and Mirabile had brought the practice with him to Detroit. He and his gang of fellow Alcamo immigrants gave back to their community in order to form an honorable, charitable figure. However, after arriving in Detroit in 1902, Mirabile would get into a conflict with Agostino Vitale. Vitale was a successful wine merchant and gang leader from Terracini, Palermo, who had his own immigrant gang and both mobs formed in the Eastern Market on Rivered Street. By 1901, Vitale was considered the main boss of Detroit. Vitale and the Teresinesi operated in such a way so that the locals loved and respected them, seeing them as caretakers, more so the mafiosi. People never owed him money, just favors, and for the most part, the two sides kept the peace in the Eastern Market, Detroit's Little Italy. Vitale made recurring trips back home to Sicily, where he reconnected with family and mafiosi, and the word was spread across Terracini that the gangsters would find a nice, comfortable, and profitable home in Detroit. However, seeing as they were both competitors in the same market, Mirabile had to make an end move against his rival, which finally took place on the night of November 23rd, 1907.
That night, Vitale was sitting at his home on Congress Street, dealing cards with two of his Sicilian friends, Paolo Scaglione and John Lynette. While his family slept upstairs, Vitale saw his cousin Andrea come through the front door. For a while now, the cousin had been requesting money to bring his wife to the US from Sicily, and while Vitale was known for his generosity towards his fellow immigrants, Andrea already had solid money and didn't need to leech it off his cousin. Vitale watched Andrea begin pacing around the table, secretly holding a long stiletto in his hand. The boss got up from the table and instantly bolted for the stairs, Andrea right behind him. As he reached the second floor of the home, Andrea grabbed at him and stuck him with the stiletto. Vitale collapsed, yelling in pain as Scaglione and Lynette ran behind Andrea, the cousin wildly swiping his knife at them. Lynette fell down the stairs with slashes to his face, while Scaglione yelled out, his stomach and chest bleeding wildly. Andrea jumped past them and ran out of the home as Vitale got up, clutched his now exposed intestinal tract, and grabbed his revolver. He ran past his family members who were now awake and panicking, chasing Andrea down into the street but missing him. His cousin got away as Vitale collapsed into the dimly lit street, bleeding out as a wagon full of cops stopped in front of the home. The boss had somehow survived. Scaglione began to suffer from peritonitis in the hospital and eventually passed away, while Vitale and Lanet survived the hit. However, despite him surviving, Vitale's reputation in the underworld would greatly decrease while he was at the hospital, enough for Mirabile to step in and become the boss of Detroit. There wasn't yet a unified Italian organization in town, but the Alcamo gang held the dominant share of the market now. Vitale became the advisor to the Teresinesi gang, as the city's gang leadership shifted, Mirabile had readied amends for Andrea to return home to Sicily on the 25th. But before he could go anywhere, officers caught him hiding out at a boarding house on Larned Street and sentenced him to life. Mirabile was now the boss of Detroit, but not too long after his rise to power, a group of three brothers would leave their farm in southern Michigan and move over to the city, changing everything. It's 1901. Two brothers, Gitano and Tony Janola, would dock in Michigan, coming over from Terracini. Back home, their dad Antonino was a fisherman, and he raised his sons in the trade. They spent their days fishing around Terracini and making money in the town's markets. And although the brothers were not connected to the mafia back home, their relatives were, and as a result, they had natural contact with the underworld. After moving over to Michigan, the pair went to work on a farm near Albion, halfway across the state from Detroit. Only a year later, the youngest brother, Salvatore, would move over to work on the farm as well. And by 1905, they were living in Detroit, in a region colloquially known as Downriver. In the Downriver area, the trio settled in an industrial town named Wyandot, 11 miles south of the Eastern Market. Due to the growing shipbuilding industry in town, plus its proximity to Detroit, a large group of Sicilians settled there around that same time. But unlike those immigrant colonies, the Genola brothers had no plans to work in a shipbuilding plant. Their family was the Stupagheri family, a secretive fraternal branch of the Sicilian Mafia. The Stupagheri had a traditional hierarchy system, closely similar to that of today's Mafia. There was a Capo Mafia, three administrative supervisors under him, and under those three were the Capo Decinas, captains of ten soldiers each. The soldiers answered to the Capo Decina, who answered to his supervisor, who answered to the boss. One of these Stupagheri gangsters was Vito Janola, who first came to Detroit and later moved to St. Louis to begin a criminal racket down there. Meanwhile, the Janola brothers' brother-in-law, Pasquale Dana, joined them in the US in 1907 with his wife and three children. Not too long after settling in New York, the Dana family disembarked to Wyandotte, and by the latter part of the decade, the Janola brothers were living amongst many of their friends from the old country, and a lot of these friends were, in fact, Stupagheri. Not too long after Pasquale's arrival, his cousin Salvatore also moved into town. 
The brothers planned on working towards opening a grocery store and using the income to establish a new criminal racket in Downriver. Salvatore and Pasquale were mafiosi from the old country, and together with their brothers-in-law, the two families would start what would soon become one of the country's most mysterious, mystical, and secretive criminal organizations. However, in order to establish a name in this new country, the men needed money first. Now in Wyandotte, Tony Giannola would marry and set off with his wife to Rayland, Ohio, a small village across the river from West Virginia, where he planned on earning money. The following year, however, he was back in Michigan, and in the summer of 1907, Agostino Vitale, prior to his stabbing, would hold the secret blood initiation of the three brothers into his clan, and their fortunes would change drastically. All alone tonight in sadness I am dreaming. They first came on the police's radar nearing the end of 1911, when a man named Sam Buendo would make a trip to the local station. Buendo was a member of the Genola gang, but for an unknown reason, he would flip to the cops and tell them about some $2,000 worth of stolen olive oil in the basement of the Genola grocery store. The oil had been stolen from the DNC steamship line, and officers raided the place found the oil, and confiscated it without any arrests, since the company refused to prosecute. And not too long afterwards, Wendell was found lying in a field near Detroit, mutilated and burned to death, establishing the nature of the criminal gangs that were to come. At some point following that incident, the Janola gang began trying to push a local fruit merchant out of town, but he refused to leave. In order to build a monopoly over the industry, they had to make sure their competition was out. And so, one day, the merchant found his horse burned in a terrible acid attack. He tried pressing charges against the gang, and was never seen again. By 1912, the Janola Dana gang had begun to exert heavy control over Wyandotte and the surrounding area, establishing their own criminal racket in town. By the time 1912 had rolled around, the gangsters had begun to feel confident enough to take on Vito Adamo, the actual boss of the Wyandotte area, and the leader of a White Hand gang faction. Adamo, born back in Sicily in the early 1880s, came over to the US early on, and by the early 1900s, he and his brother Salvatore had set up a White Hand criminal racket in Wyandotte. The White Hand was essentially the opposite of the Black Hand. It was a protection racket for the locals, who were being unfairly targeted by the Black Hand gang of the Ginola brothers and the Dana family. And so, the two mobs got into a natural conflict. Across April of 1913, a street war broke out between both gangs, leading to Adamo fleeing to Detroit where he sought to operate his crew and seize the Wando beer trade from the Genola faction. He joined forces with Pietro Mirabile and for the first period, the attempts at taking shots at the Genola brothers were successful. The Adamos began to deliver their beer with free ice to their customers, which got them more sales. That same month, two Genola gangsters were murdered on Adamo's orders, Guglielmo Catalano and John Gervasso. In August of 1913, a black hand extortionist and high up member of the Genola gang, Carlo Calecca was shot at by Adamo and his soldier, Filippo Bucalato. He managed to hold on to life long enough and named his attackers to the cops. But not too long afterwards, he passed from sepsis. In October, the pair were acquitted for the murder after Kaleka's wife testified that her husband revealed he wasn't actually sure who'd shot him. In November, Adamo ally, Ferdinand Palma, a former cop, was murdered, and Vito and Salvatore were arrested. Palma was a Detroit officer until 1905, when he was caught participating in a human trafficking ring. He was given a 60 day long furlough from his post, but he made so much money during those two months that he decided ultimately to quit. After losing his job, he went on to be a banker and a labor broker, who helped with immigrants getting jobs. He'd been killed, likely on the orders of the Genola gang, and although his allies were taken in for the slaying, they were obviously let go. On November 24, around 5 p.m., the two Adamo brothers left Mirabile's wine company building, where they were employed as traveling wine salesmen. They began to walk home on East Lafayette when they were approached by two men in long coats. The two pulled out sawed-off shotguns and opened fire on both Vito and Salvatore, taking them both down. The Black Handers ran off as officers showed up to find both brothers practically dead, 
Vito passing on the way to the hospital, and Salvatore dying only half an hour afterwards. In 1914, Mirabile fled the city, ceding control to his rivals. And with that, the Mirabile and Adamo story was over, and the Genola Dana mob became the prominent gang in Wyando. Their gang ran the town's beer rackets, and soon enough, they were one of the largest mobs in the greater Detroit area. Their faction included men like Guglielmo Tocco, Giuseppe Zarilli, Angelo Melli, and Salvatore Catalanotte. Meanwhile, Tony led the gang, Gaetano was a second in command, and Sam was a captain who led a murder crew. The future of the growing Detroit mob looked bright, but they were still a long way to go from becoming the dominant crew in town. Following the end of the Adamo gang and the Janola's rise to power, things would quickly change across Wyando and Ford City. In 1916, two local merchants, Harry Paul and Morris Harris, opened up a competing grocery store to that owned by the Janola brothers, and so Sam approached the businessmen and offered 7000 for their shop. They agreed on the promise of a $200 down payment, which Sam provided them. However, after the sale was finalized, he stopped paying any more of the seven grand, and the two angrily demanded that he give them what they were owed. The two were found dead not too long after that meeting. And then, the gangsters would form an alliance with the Vitale Gang. The Vitale Gang had remained generally neutral over the past conflict, and continued to sell their alcohol product, steering clear of the war. The gang was now led by Giovanni Vitale, a native to Cenisi, Sicily, born back in the 1870s. He'd first come over to the US in 1903, settling in Detroit, but left to return home in 1907. By 1910, however, he was a permanent resident of the city. And now that the Janola gang was coming up fast, and they'd forced Mirabile out of Detroit, Vitale had decided to get in on the action, and partner up with them as a means of expanding his reach in the bootlegging operation. Vitale's gang was made up of a few other men, Peter Bosco, Joseph Stefano, and Sam Cipriano. With time, the Vitale organization became incredibly close to the Janola brothers, and the two mobs made heavy money. That was, however, until Tony and Peter got into an argument. The fight was over a shared bakery business the men owned, and how the money from the business should be split between them. As a result, they had a falling out, which would soon enough affect the entire operation. Tony Giannola forced three of Peter's crewmates, one of them Andrea Licato, to carry out a hit on their captain. Although they were reluctant, Tony wasn't a guy you said no to, and this began to form a deep hatred within the men towards the Giannola gang. On October 8, 1918, Peter Bosco was sitting inside the office of a mechanic's garage he used to sell vehicles his gang stole, when the three guys walked in through the back door. The four spoke for about 15 minutes before the hit crew supposedly left, and soon enough, neighbors heard gunshots ring out across the street. Bosco was then found dead at his desk, and the Vitale gang and Ginola gang were soon at arms. By the latter part of the year, Vitale had split off from Ginola, began an independent mob with the Bosco loyalists, the same men who'd been sent to kill him by Tony. One of the most brutal wars in Detroit underworld history would then break out, and many men in the Ginola organization would prove themselves to be loyal, fearless, murderous men, namely Tocco, Zerilli, and Michael Santo Polizzi. On the night of January 3rd, 1919, Tony was approaching the home of a slain gang friend to visit the man's family. As he walked up to the house's front door, however, the same men who he'd sent to kill Bosco a few months prior jumped out of an alley and gunned him down. The boss of the Janola gang was dead, and his role went to his brother Sam. It wasn't looking good for the family. Talks of fleeing Detroit were brought up, 
but Sam wasn't going anywhere. The following month, he managed to survive a hit attempt while out with Pasquale Dana, but while he managed to get away unscathed, Dana wasn't so lucky. Sam then ordered a retaliatory attack, sending his soldiers to spray the Vitale gang's grocery store with bullets at the very same time that Dana was being laid into his grave to send a message. No gangsters were hurt in the attack, but an officer was shot to death by Vitale, who mistook him for a gangster and was swiftly arrested afterwards. Less than a month later, Sam was taken in for Grand Theft Auto. Officers had been tipped off by a resident named Charles Barra, who owned a car garage that the Janola gang had stolen from. One afternoon, Barra received a bizarre phone call telling him that if he were to go down to Lafayette Avenue that same night, his car would be returned to him. However, he knew that if he went to that meeting, he wouldn't walk out alive. He notified the 3rd Precinct officers and they followed him to the curbside where the gangsters had told him to be. They found a car and they found Sam Janola, Peter Carollo, Leonard Cerula, and Jim Baracco, all inside the vehicle, armed with machine guns. The morning after Sam's arrest, he had a troop of soldiers storm the Wayne County Jail, fully armed. They weren't satisfied by their last attempt on the Vitale gang. And so they found three men visiting Vitale, his son Giuseppe and two of his crewmates, Salvatore Evola and Vito Renda, and sprayed them with a gunfire. Vitale and Evola managed to survive, getting each hit only once, while Renda fell to the floor, 21 bullets in his system. Somehow, Renda survived for a little bit after the shooting, and identified Sam as his shooter just before passing away. Sam Janola went to court for the murder trial, and less than 50 minutes later, was found innocent. In May, a house fire at a Janola residence took the lives of two of Sam's sons, and so representatives from both gang factions decided to hold a sit-down and finally put this thing to rest. Janola and Vitale met and negotiated an agreement regarding the regional liquor racket and black hand activities, and they wrote a pact using their own blood, but Vitale clearly had no intention of upholding the treaty. <laughs> The Prohibition Act had begun to materialize in October of that same year, illegalizing the sale and distribution of alcohol across the country, and the gangsters knew that illegalizing a vice brought them more money than they could imagine, and so, Vitale had to eliminate the competition early on. During the afternoon of October 2nd, Sam left his macaroni company office on Monroe Street and walked to the American State Bank to cash a check in order to bet on the Baseball World Series. And after exiting the bank, three hitmen stepped into the parking lot and opened fire on Sam. Sam ran back inside the bank, collapsing on the floor as the hitmen ran away, leaving him dead inside the building. He'd been hit almost 30 times, and at his funeral, his wife swore revenge. Their organization was split into two smaller gangs, with Gitano Janola backing down, while Vitale muscled himself in as the boss of the Detroit mob. With Mirabile, Adamo, and Janola gone, Vitale became the new, almost unchallenged boss of the Detroit mob. However, it was clear he was overconfident in his status, because although the remaining resistance toward him was small and separated, it was still there. Out of the fall of the Janola gang, two new factions emerged. The first one was led by a young, 20-year-old Janola lieutenant named Giuseppe Manzello, also known as Joe Manzello. Manzello was a mob gunman who, in the fall out of the original gang, led a team of younger guys who liked his style and charisma. The other side of the family was the older generation, led by Salvatore Catalanotte, a member of the El Camo faction of the mob, who'd fled his native town years prior. Back home in El Camo, a severe phylorexia outbreak had led to the failure of two major banks, causing major financial issues that had led to Catalanotte joining thousands of immigrants to the United States. On August 10, 1920, Manzello was standing outside his apartment on a curb by the street. He shared the living space with Polizzi and Zrilli, and he stood with the former roommate and their friend Meli to speak outside. Suddenly, a Vitale hit car sped by. 
and bullets flew out the windows. Manzello fell to the ground, being hit eight times, while Polizzi was struck with seven shots. Mele hit the curb and took off, surviving the attack, while Polizzi recovered in the hospital. But Manzello, their young leader and close friend, died only a few days later, and they knew it was Vitale who'd called the hit. With Manzello gone, Catalanote would step in to fill the gap and unite both sides of the Ginola mob yet again. He was a well-respected man, trained under the old consigliere Gaetano Ginola and president of the Detroit branch of the Unione Siciliana, a mob-controlled ethnic union that helped Sicilian immigrants settle into their new lives as American citizens. Catalanote aligned himself with Toco and a man named Cesare Lamare. Prohibition boss out of Hamtramck, who ran a place known as the Venice Cafe. Out of the cafe, he ran a profitable criminal enterprise and was close to members of the Detroit Mafia. On August 11, the Manzello crew, led by Zerilli and six men, did a hit on Vitale's nephew, Antonio Badalamenti, killing him in front of his Detroit area grocery store. The seven men, including Toco, were taken in but let off free two days down the line. Catalanote brought the gangs together and became the boss of the West Side Mob. As a sign of respect and to keep the peace, he gave the Manzella gang to Mele as a crew, known as the East Side Mob, and he appointed Toko and Zerilli as Mele's administrative panel. A unified Detroit Mafia was finally taking shape, and with the strength of both sides behind him, Catalanote finally had the opportunity to exact his revenge and seize the city's prohibition rackets from Vitale. Vitale was now too afraid to even leave his own home on Russell Street. On August 18, Vitale, his son Giuseppe, and his wife finally exited the home when a Zerilli led hit crew did a shotgun drive by on them. The 17 year old Giuseppe died, but Vitale survived with minor injuries. And then, in the early morning hours of September 28, Vitale was gunned down by two speeding cars who shot a collective 18 shots into him. At around 3 a.m., the boss fell down and Catalanote took his title. On October 16, less than a month later, the remnants of the Vitale mob were taken out by Catalanote hitmen. At around 4.55 p.m., Andrea Lecato left the grocery store of a relative, walking down Clinton Street when a Ford delivery car sped up by him and stopped at the curb. Suddenly, the back flew open as three men lying down in their stomachs pumped Lecato full of machine gun lead. Less than 10 minutes later, Frank Caruso and Rocco Caressa were standing in the window of a local grocery store when a car flying by the front of the store blasted the window with bullets, injuring both men, although not fatally. The message had been sent and the Vitale faction was gone. Detroit finally had a new boss and an official, unified mafia behind him. It was the perfect start to the Prohibition era. Catalanote, in a similar fashion to what the bosses of New York would do a decade later, would bring together the city's Italian gangs and unify them under the Pascuzzi Combine, a liquor smuggling and distribution partnership. Each gang leader was given a region to oversee, make money from, and kick up all while strengthening the Mafia's hold over the city. Soon, the Combine oversaw a vast, wealthy criminal empire, operating in bootlegging, prostitution, heroin trafficking, extortion, and illegal gambling. A city that was once plagued with brutal, gangland violence, now had an established underworld of captains, soldiers, and associates, each with their own territory and operations. The alcohol was brought into Detroit through bootleggers from Canada, who brought their product in through fleets of small speedboats. The mafiosi would bribe the patrol officers working in or along the river, allowing these boats to move across undetected. With time, they made more money and upgraded their operation to larger, heavier boats in order to satiate the increasing demand. With the slow and aggressive end of the Purple Gang, Detroit's once infamously powerful Jewish bootlegging syndicate, the Sicilians had more freedom to expand their operations. The Purple Gang had suffered through years of legal issues, infighting, and gangland conflict, and by the latter 20s, they were all but gone. Most of their members either in jail, dead, or drifted out of the game to go into legitimate work outside of Detroit. A lot of them had been killed off by the Sicilians, who, wanting to take over the city 
city's alcohol market needed to eliminate the gang. In a war soon followed, one of the men involved in this war was James Licavoli, a gangster from St. Louis. Licavoli was born all the way back on August 18, 1904. He was one of four children in the Licavoli family, his parents being Sicilian immigrants who moved to St. Louis years prior. With time, the young Licavoli would join the Russo gang with his cousins Peter and Thomas, one of the early beginnings of organized crime in St. Louis. On October 6, 1926, Licavoli got into a police chase, and following the end of the chase, got into a violent shootout. He was struck in the leg and charged for carrying a concealed weapon, even though he'd openly fired on the cops. His weapons charge was dropped as well, and he received no formal jail time as a result of the event. On August 9, 1927, the Cavoli was standing with a group of associates just outside Chicago. The Russo gang had become involved in a bloody civil conflict with the other gangs in town, and it reached its peak around that point of the year, making Licavoli's crew a target. A car sped past them as gunmen opened fire, and two of his friends were killed in the outcome of the drive-by. As such, Licavoli fled St. Louis with his two cousins, and settled in Detroit, joining the local Mafia clan, where he helped eliminate the Purple Gang, and was sent off to the big house as a result. Windsor, Ontario was the growing hub for gang activity around Detroit. The province had never placed a ban or limit on the production and exploitation of alcohol, making it safe for the Detroit mafiosi to get their hands on the product. Once the alcohol was acquired, the rum runners sped it across the river by boat, paying off officers who looked too close. As time passed, the city upped the Riverside Police Force, but the officers just kept taking the bribes. By the late 20s, an influx of Canadian immigrants from Ontario had begun to come down to Detroit to find work on the newly growing automotive lines, which gave the Combine even more opportunities to move alcohol down to this city. Eventually, the process of traveling between both borders was expedited when the Detroit Windsor Tunnel was constructed in 1930, making it easier than ever to smuggle alcohol into Michigan. And then, in February of 1930, Cattelanote passed from pneumonia. Only a day before he would turn 36, his seat then went to Gaspar Milazzo. Milazzo was born back in the 1880s in Castellamare del Golfo, in Sicily. He moved to Brooklyn around 1911, settling there and operating within the Castellamarese clan of the local mafia. Milazzo was a generally friendly and peaceful man, getting himself the nickname The Peacemaker. He settled in his new home alongside his cousin Stefano Magadino, both Castellamarese mafiosi, but the two faced heavy opposition from the Bucalato clan, a fellow Castellamarese mob. Back home in Sicily, the Magadino family, allied with another gangster named Vito Bonventre, had been in a war with the Bucalato clan. Across the conflict, Magadino's brother Pietro and his ally Stefano Benano and his brother Giuseppe were murdered by the Bucalati, while Bonventre, Magadino and Malazzo fled the region, settling in New York City and bringing the war with them. <laughs> Now in their new home, the men begin a group known as the Good Killers, a Castellamarese hit crew led by Bonventre that carried out murders in relation to the war back home. In 1917, Felice Bucalato, the boss of the Bucalato clan, was clipped by the Good Killers. And then, in mid-21, Camilo Caiozzo, the man who'd killed Pietro back in Sicily five years prior, was murdered by the Good Killers in Avon, New York. One of the men on the hit job, Bartolo Fontana, would turn himself in only a few weeks later, and revealed that the crew had killed 16 others, including Salvatore, Felice, Joseph, and Pietro Bucolato across 1917 and 1919. Fontana and the cops set up a sting operation where he would meet Magadino at Grand Central to take $30 in cash to aid in hiding from law enforcement. And following the transaction, the cops would swoop in, grab their target, and get out. 
It was a straightforward operation until the state of New Jersey dropped all charges against the good killers. Fontana was hauled off to jail while Magadino and Milazzo decided to then flee the city. Magadino ran west to Buffalo where he would join the local mafia and use his gangland connections to become the boss in 1922. Milazzo settled in Detroit where he would join Catalanote's gang and use his connections to rise up in the Detroit underworld. He helped set up the Pascuzzi Combine, helped bring together the local gangs, decimate the remnants of the Purple Gang, and now that Catalanote was dead, take charge of the organization. He had the East Side Gang on his side, men like Toco, Zirilli, and Meli, who gave him great support while they also aligned with the Licavoli family, James, Thomas, and Peter, who'd been instrumental in helping wipe out the Purple Gang. Milazzo continued his relatively civil reign over the Detroit mob until a new war broke out in the city. This time, it wasn't between immigrants from Castellamare del Golfo, it was between Giuseppe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano, immigrants from Trapani and Castellamare del Golfo respectively. The conflict between the two men had exploded into a full-blown war that left not only New York mafiosi dead, the mafiosi who aligned with either side across the country, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Detroit all became proxy fronts for the war. Back in Detroit, tensions had been secretly rising between Milazzo and Cesare Lemare, who, although holding a heavily successful racket in Hamtramck, and the current leader of the West Side Mob, hated the fact that Milazzo had become boss before him. Milazzo was a friend to all, and had helped Lamare by protecting him many times in the past, but he still wanted the man gone, and Masseria saw an opportunity. Seeing as Milazzo and Magadino were Castellamarese immigrants, they had both been secretly supporting Maranzano's side of the war, and in 1930, decided to openly support him. Lamare began forming a plot to murder not just Milazzo, but Meli, Toko, and Zarelli, and due to his jealousy, a war soon formed yet again within Detroit, this time between the West and East Side mob, the West controlled by Lamare and the East by Milazzo. Lamare then set up a peace negotiation with Meli at the Werner Highway Fish Market, where he had three gunmen hide out of view, ready to gun down the captain on his command. Meli feared that if he went to that meeting, he'd never make it back, so he figured it'd make more sense to send the much more highly respected and feared Milazzo instead. He didn't think there'd be a situation in which Lamare would clip the boss himself, which to them was an out-of-the-question situation. He thought that with the man's baggage, the peace deal could actually reach a peaceful conclusion, and Milazzo accepted, him too knowing that killing a boss would never work. But Masseria was supporting Lamare, and he had no intentions of respecting the boss's position. On May 31st, 1930, Milazzo and his driver, Sam Perino, met at the fish market, sitting down to eat lunch while waiting for Lamare. Suddenly, out of nowhere, two gunmen, Joe Amico and Elmer McLeanad, leapt out of nowhere and opened fire on the pair, killing both the boss and his bodyguard. And the cross-town mafia war exploded into Detroit streets. The East Side wanted revenge for the boss's death especially since he'd been so good to Lamare in the past. In between the beginning of June and end of July, over 14 mafiosi were killed, most from Lamare's side, slowly chipping away at his faction. He fled the city and ran into hiding, remotely directing his soldiers wall away. However, on July 23rd, Gerald Buckley, a famous Detroit radio broadcaster, was shot 11 times in the lobby of the LaSalle Hotel by members of the East Side mob. The city cops cracked down on the gangland war, while grand jury was appointed to investigate the mafia's crimes. The war immediately went quiet, while Meli and the Licavoli cousins ran off into hiding, the latter three going south to Toledo, Ohio. Meli then brought forth two assassins from the May 31st shooting, and made it clear to them that if they didn't turn on Lamare and take him out, they would become the next two victims of the street war. On February 6, Lamare pulled up into his driveway and entered the home with his bodyguard Giuseppe Gerardo before asking his wife to drive Gerardi home. She left the home as the boss sat down to eat with Amico and Maclinand. Before Amico began to distract Lamare, the two spoke as Maclinand got up with the ruse of washing dishes before pulling out his handgun and shooting Lamare in the back of the head. The job was done and the East Side's revenge had been exacted. Lamare's wife came home hours later to find her husband slumped in his chair, lifeless, while Gerardi fled the city and joined up with the Pittsburgh mob. 
Only three years later, as Gerardi stood outside his Pittsburgh home with his brother-in-law Joseph Grande, they were approached by two men. One of the men first asked Joe if his name was Jim. When Joe corrected him, the man pulled out a handgun and told him his name was Jim. He opened fire on a panicked Gerardi who took off running. He fell into the street as the gunman hit him four more times before his killers took off. The Crosstown War was finally over, and following the conflict, the Detroit Mafia would enter a period of peace, success, and heavy money. Lamare was now gone, and the Detroit Mafia once again reunited under the leadership of the East Side Mob administration. Meli, Toko, and Zarelli united with John Preziola and Peter Licavoli to form a new council to run the family. Now known as the Detroit Partnership, Toko became the head of the organization, and they managed to survive the remainder of the Castellamarese War, with Masseria being killed by his own men on April 15, and Maranzano being murdered by the same men on September 10. The leader of these men, Salvatore Lucania, better known as Charles Luciano, then organized the state of the mob in both New York and across the country, and a commission was formed that united the men and kept the relations between them relatively peaceful. Meanwhile, business was blooming in Detroit. Now as boss, Toko instituted a new membership policy that would change everything for the family. His family became distinct from the others across the US in that only the relatives of family members could be made. If you wanted to join the partnership by blood, yet to marry into it, be born into it, and have some sort of familial connection to it. This way, the mafiosi would naturally insulate themselves from the law, since family was less likely to have a rat on family. With time, the family's composition would be made up of sons, uncles, cousins, fathers, and nephews. A lot of them shared last names, and with time, the family would become the most well-protected gang across the country. Toko and Zarelli pooled the money they'd made from the Pascuzzi Combine and purchased Pfeiffer Brewing, a Detroit malt producer. However, on February 5th, 1932, a massive raid was held against Pfeiffer, leading to Toko being arrested for conspiracy to violate the Prohibition Act. And only eight days later, Pfeiffer was forcibly shut down by the Fed for illegally producing wort using their plant. The wort was skimmed off of legal alcohol production and used to make bootlegged beer. Zerili and Toko were then barred from operating in the legal alcohol production market and were forced to sell off the brewing company. In March of 1936, Toko was charged with tax evasion, and although getting off with the settlement in 37, the media attention that the trial brought him forced him to retire by his own will. Eventually, however, he was convicted for evasion and got eight years behind bars. Now fully out of the picture, his his role was given to Zerili, his underboss and now his brother-in-law as well. Zerili rose up to lead the family's leading panel, becoming the boss of the partnership, and while Toko was behind bars, he served the role of Zerili's underboss. Meanwhile, in 1939, a large family bootlegging ring was busted up by the feds, serving a major blow to the organization. The ring was run by Emmanuel Badalamenti, known by the nickname Rolf Manuel, who was considered the family's consigliere following Toko's arrest. Badalamenti ran a 19-man illicit liquor ring out of a Monroe pool room, although the entire operation ran between Detroit and Toledo. In 1939, he and six men were taken in when the ring was busted, and all seven of them were sentenced due to income tax evasion, with Badalamenti owing some 200k. Toko and Badalamenti then both got out of jail in the early 1940s, and following his release, Badalamenti still had to pay his back taxes. Although he'd evaded paying 200,000 to the fed, he only owed 5,000 and decided to take a poor debtor's oath to save the money. Toko kept his status within the partnership but decided to move south to Florida, taking an advisory role in Detroit's day-to-day -day affairs. He moved to Miami and continued aiding Zerili in running the organization. By the time the 1940s swung around, the Detroit Mafia had been making more money than ever before. They held rackets within the drug trade, tax-free alcohol distribution, bookmaking, extortion, and union control. Through their chokehold over the Detroit labor unions, they were able to get construction and garbage dumping contracts thrown their way, 
Meanwhile, Toko's policy of keeping the partnership within the family had been going rather successfully. By the time the 1940s came around, the Detroit partnership was dominated by a small number of last names, namely Toko, Mele, Zerilli, Licavoli, Giacalone, and Corrado. No one was saying anything to the feds, as the family kept up their string of murders and illegal activity. There was no needless mutiny, no disrespect towards the boss, and no internal conflict. Everybody knew each other. They'd been in each other's houses, had dinner together, and celebrated Christmas under the same tree and Thanksgiving around the same table. Toka's idea had worked shockingly well. In 1942, police raided a social club in the city's Lower East Side. The building, named the American Lebanese Club, was home to a gambling racket centered around an old-school dice game named Barbuth, which may have been where the Lebanese and the name came from. The place was operated by brothers Tony and Vito Giacalone, members of the local mafia from an early age. Tony was born in the city's east side back in 1919. He wasn't born into a gang family, instead spending his days on the back of his dad's produce wagon, enviously watching wealthy, diamond-crusted mafiosi pass by him, casually carrying hundreds of bills. Tony was related by blood to Catalanotte, and at some point in his life, he stopped helping with his dad's small, honest business and began spending more time with the gangster side of his family. In 1937, an 18-year-old Giacalone was charged for the first time, and by the time he was in his early 20s, he'd been arrested five individual times, never spending any more than three nights in jail. He and his brother, who'd followed him into the gang, ran a lucrative gambling game out of the club, but after the 1942 raid, it had become a central focus of local cops, and over the next decade and a half, it was raided some 18 different times and not a single charge came out of any of the raids. In 1948, the partnership began working with the Detroit suburb of Hazel Park, specifically the Hazel Park Stadium Company. That year, Waldo Andrews, a town car dealer, had won a month-long option letter to own the company, and so he visited his lawyer, James Belenka. He explained to Belenka that the orders of his option letter and the company plan included the construction of an auto racing track in Hazel Park. Belenka began to look for potential investors, and he went to Toko and Zerilli, wealthy Detroit mafiosi, to help out. The mafiosi joined in on forming the Hazel Park Racing Association, and they financially supported the track. Construction began immediately and was swiftly successful. Zerili's son Anthony, a college-educated mafioso who'd become a made man after committing murder only two years prior to his graduation, was named president of the racing association the day he graduated, and he oversaw a very profitable enterprise along with his cousin Jack Toko, also a finance graduate. The track made Zerili a rich man, making some 15 million a year in revenue with the son getting 1.2 million of it. Zerili worked with his cousin running the track, since Toko understood business a little better than him. The family was making money, quietly, and the cops couldn't seem to break through their iron defense. By the time the 1950s rolled around, gambling had become one of the family's largest rackets. Tony Giacalone had become a pickup man, working under the Licavoli crew run by Peter Licavoli. By now, Peter's brother Thomas and their cousin James had gone their own separate paths in life. Thomas had worked closely with Peter during the Prohibition era, but got a life conviction for murder back in 1934. Meanwhile, James had fled the city and ran down to Cleveland to work under then-boss Alfred Polizzi, who was a rising star in Ohio. Giacalone collected gambling debts for Peter, who had them collected for Zerilli. He'd never actually received a legitimate conviction until August of 1954, when he got his first legitimate sentence after 14 arrests. The young Giacalone got eight months behind bars and was fined for the court costs, and after getting out, spent another week after refusing to testify before a grand jury. He was proving his loyalty, dedication, and business savviness 
and his Lebanese club was doing good and racking in the cash. In 1959, a local gambler named Asab Jordan approached officers after building up a $5,000 debt to the club, and they set up a 24-7 sting op. Officers secretly snuck cameras outside the club, installed lights, and began watching the mafiosi who swung by. However, the gangsters soon found out about the operation, and themselves began to take photos of the cameras and officers to annoy them back. On December 29, officers raided the club, nabbed 28 mafiosi, gamblers and associates, 11 of them being taken to court. Officers believed that Vito Giacalone and his associate Mike Thomas were the ones running the club, and they alleged that the place brought in $10,000 every weekend. Jordan, although brought forth to testify, attempted to commit suicide midway through the case, and as a result, the entire thing fell apart. Not a single person saw any jail time as a result of the government's months of surveillance, and the 11 men brought to court pleaded guilty, but only received minor fines, with Giacalone getting the worst one. He was forced to cough up $300, but for a man of his stature and position, 300 was nothing. Following the end of the trial, the Lebanese club shut down, and in its place, the Lower East Side of Detroit Club, or the Lessoed Club, was opened. The Giacalone brothers decided to institute stricter security measures this time. In order to not have another run-in with the law, the place was registered as a men's club, and they held the bar booth game upstairs, out of view, in a locked room with a peephole on the door. They had guards outside the establishment, keeping the front door to the building locked at all times and the security made sure to screen and check everyone who came through. When cops did show up, in order to keep up appearances, Vito and his bodyguard Otis allowed the cops in. The officers walked through the doors and heard scrambling men upstairs as they bound the steps to the upper floor. By the time they got to the game room, all they found was a group of guys sitting at tables, playing checkers. The club was doing better now, even with the prior indictments, and on any good night, the mafiosi brought in some 30 grand from the highly profitable game. At some point down the line, however, officers subpoenaed the men coming in and out of the club, but all of them pleaded the fifth. Officers then received a warrant to search the building, but before they could get through the doors, the place was shut down. Giacalone knew it was no longer safe to operate in Detroit, so they had the Lessoed move just outside the city limits in River Rouge, which bordered the Detroit neighborhoods of Carbon Works and Oakwood Heights directly. It's now November 9, 1962. 112 agents and officers from the Detroit POD, IRS, and state police bust through the doors of the seemingly abandoned Gotham Hotel. The Gotham was a large, luxurious hotel in the Detroit Midtown that catered to the city's African-American population. The hotel had been active for two decades by then under the Gotham title, but in recent years its popularity had begun to die out as a result of the American Civil Rights Movement, opening the doors of once off-limits hotels to the city's black residents. The Gotham had no strength in the market now that it was fully integrated with hotels of a greater caliber. And so, in September of 1962, the building closed its doors. But it turns out, the place had become a hotspot for the numbers racket, Detroit's black lottery system controlled by the local mafia. One of the original hotel founders and operators, John White, was an associate to Giacalone and was usually inside the hotel, helping run the operation. The building was rigged so that each floor of the hotel had a numbers office, while the hotel switchboard was rigged so that the hotel operator would set off an alarm on every floor of the building if and when cops came in. The operator could detect the police's presence through a television in the lobby linked to a camera network outside. Officers stormed towards the hotel elevators, only to discover that the operator had cut the power to them. They began to ran up the stairs, going all the way up to the 10th floor penthouse, where they discovered a dice game with a 5k total bet on the table. The police nabbed 41 men, including White, alongside 60,000 in cash, almost 200,000 bet slips, and 33 gaming machines. The following day, nine men were held in custody for tax evasion and not holding gambling stamps. And while awaiting trial, White would pass away. Mob gamblers in Detroit knew that the Gotham Raid was a sign of a shifting era in city policing. They recognized the fact that they could no longer truly run their games in town. And as a result of the raids, many of them fled the city and opened their games in the surrounding suburbs and townships. For the operators who decided to stick around, they were constantly under police surveillance. 
and were often busted up as a result. It was discovered in the investigation that the Gotham was running a $21 million a year gambling enterprise, and it wasn't the only mob-connected hotel in town. Charles Chicky the Bookie Sherman was a beloved and generous local bookmaker who ran an operation out of the Anchor Bar, a place he used as an office. He'd position himself near the bar payphones throughout the day, where he ran a massive gambling enterprise. He also held frequent meetings at the Imperial Hotel. At some point in the 1960s, Detroit officers had a secret informant, not a member of the family of course, who ran the restaurant at the hotel to go undercover. He informed them regarding a small robbery crew of four men in their 20s in the area, and he explained to them how they were all army veterans who used expensive walkie-talkies to plan armed heists in Detroit, and their connection to Sherman through the hotel. The informant revealed that on May 8, 1963, 5th Precinct Inspector Jean Guybig was at the hotel with Chicky, and both men drank into the night with the inspector himself getting drunk as the two spoke. The informant also revealed that both Guybig and fellow inspector Paul Sheridan were friends of Chicky's and met with him pretty often at the hotel to drink together during the late hours of the day. One night, the informant watched as Chicky slipped money to Guybig while he also bragged to the informant about how he was also paying off criminal investigators. He revealed mob connections to Chicky, including James Baracco, the bookmaker's son to mafioso Sam Baracco. On some occasions, Mike Thomas was seen at the hotel by the informant, meeting up with Chicky in the parking lot, and when the bar booth game had been busted up, the informant revealed that Thomas was the one who helped relocate it. By the time the 1970s rolled around, the Detroit Partnership was a sprawling, powerful criminal enterprise that held interests in numerous facets of daily life across the US. The family had control over the city's gambling games, Teamsters Union branches, waste disposal businesses, narcotics trafficking networks. Outside of Detroit, they held interests in Florida, Vegas, and other major cities, including San Diego. In Vegas, the family had secret interests in numerous casinos, as well as participating in a skimming racket that they ran alongside other mob families, including the Cleveland Outfit. In 1968, problems arose regarding the ownership of the partnership's lucrative garbage business, Tri-County Sanitation, when the son-in-law of a mafia captain was accused of rape. Peter Vitale, better known by his nickname Bozzi, was born in Chinisi back in 1908, and as part of the course, was related by blood to the old Vitale regime of decades prior. His wife Agatha was the daughter of Salvatore Zerilli, the young brother to Joe Zerilli. Bozzi was close to numerous high-ranking members of the organization, including the Corrado family, whom he worked very closely with. Bozzi got his early beginnings working as the night manager at the Gresham Gardens restaurant in Detroit, a family business of the Corrado family. Through his work at the gardens, Bozzi became connected to Pete Corrado, a gambling operator who worked under Pete Licavoli. And until 1957, Bozzi ruled the gambling business in Detroit's Greek town. However, that year, Corrado would pass away, and Bozzi decided to switch career paths. Instead of focusing his energy on gambling, the Vitale family decided decided to focus on the garbage industry. Bozzi was the youngest of his brothers, and with his work, the Detroit Mafia would move into the waste hauling world and legally take over the industry. On March 3rd, 1963, Joseph Barbara Jr. would marry into Bozzi's family through one of his daughters. Barbara was the son to Joe Barbara Sr., one of the largest Castellamarese captains under the Buffalino family of upstate New York. In 1959, however, a 53-year-old Barbara would pass away, leading to his son moving to Detroit to find work there using his mob connections. Eventually, he married into the organization. It was the local mob's largest event in years, seeing as it was the introduction of a new bloodline into the partnership. In February of 1962, Bozzi, his brother Paul, and Barbara would come together to form Tri-County Sanitation and Tri-County Leasing. The group pooled their cash to invest in 20 advanced garbage compacting trucks, 
which they branded with red and white paint as their brand colors. Not only were their trucks double the size of their competitors, but they also had the latest advancements in garbage technology. This is aside from the fact that they offered lower prices than the competition and ran a constant round-the-clock pickup service. With their connections to the Teamsters Union, the trio paid their drivers $40 less per week than their competition, meaning they could easily lower their prices. Teamsters International President Jimmy Hoffa let it slide without the threat of a labor strike which was a major advantage. By 1963, Tri-County was doing good, and things just got better for Bozzi and Barbara. At some point that year, a massive grand jury investigation indicted five trash haulers and almost 30 public employees for fraud. The companies had been understating the size of their garbage loads in order to scam the city by paying lower dumping fees. And the companies who were under the chopping block were banned from participating in the carting business. As a result, Bozzi's entire competition was wiped out, and soon enough, he held a pseudo-monopoly over the local hauling industry. For the smaller dumpers still left in the market, Tri-County forced them into a corner through legal business practices and offered them a sale price. This allowed the owners of the competition to leave the market with an actual profit, while Tri-County took their routes. Bozzi was enjoying his involvement in the business, which, technically speaking, was completely legal. Tri-County, plus the Greek town racket, was making his family heavy money, while Licavoli gave Barbara permission to expand his business into Toledo. There, Barbara and the Tri-County took over the Sylvania Township King Road Dump, which they controlled under the Tri-County title. However, 1968 would bring misfortune with it, when Barbara was accused of rape by a woman named Dolores Lazaros. Dolores was married to Pete Lazaros, a Vitale payoff man. She'd accused the young Barbara of not just rape against her, but extortion against their family. And after her husband was arrested and flipped to the state, he began testifying against the mafiosi he once worked with. The rape charge was eventually dropped, but the mafioso was convicted for extortion, while Lazaros himself was facing issues after committing perjury 12 times before a grand jury. Barbara met with his attorney Nick Michelli and his brother-in-law and requested that Tri-County be sold to a Boston hauling company for $5 million. Michelli had $1.5 million worth of company stocks sold, splitting the money into proceeds that he disguised as loans. He then passed a quarter of the fraudulent loans to himself, Barbara and the two Vitales, while the remaining company stock was used to get the brothers back into the sanitation business. Michelli used the company value to secure a loan, which he then used to begin the Central Sanitation Services, based in Hamtramck. Meanwhile, in 1970, the aging Joseph Zerilli decided to step down from his role as boss of Detroit, and his role was ceded to his son Tony. What will it bring? I keep asking this question And there's no answering Is there something waiting By this point in time, Tony had become a rich man running his rackets out of the Spaghetti Place restaurant near the Macomb Mall in Roseville. The eatery was opened up in 68 and became a mob meeting hotspot fairly quickly. He began investing further into the Hazel Park track. His cousin Toko had been doping the horses and rigging illegal betting games at the track, which, along with the actual revenue, was making them heavy cash. In August of 1970, he, his cousin, and mafioso Dominic Corrado, who ran a family crew with his brother Tony the Bull, began a plan to open a second racetrack in Hollywood, Florida, under the Hazel Park Association. The planned property for the track was a massive 280-acre plot worth $2.5 million, and the plan was for the track to be called Hazel Park South. But things quickly turned when Anthony began to face legal issues related to his Vegas holdings. Real estate investment had been a primary focus of Tony and his cousin since both men had graduated with degrees in finance. It turns out Tony Zarelli and his associate Michael Polizzi secretly owned the Frontier Hotel in Vegas. And as a result, Zarelli was convicted and hauled off to jail. 
His dad, now retired and old, had to step back into the high seat until either his son got out or until a new boss could be found. Not only was the Hazel Park self-development cancelled, but in 1972, Zerili and the other owners of the Hazel Park Raceway also sold off the original property. The elder Zerili was, unfortunately for him, back in charge of the family, but things still looked bright for the partnership. The media attention on them was significantly less than that of the other crime families, and the legal attention on them was practically nothing. For the most part, the partnership of families involved in the syndicate ran a tight ship, exerting their control over the unions, extorting local businesses, making millions off of narcotics distribution through the connections back home to Sicily. But all that would change when Jimmy Hoffa would have a falling out with the mob and suddenly go missing.